a Japanese public bathhouse, Sento. From the outside, it looks like a Shinto shrine or Buddhist temple. Inside, the bathing hall boasts a wall painting worthy of an art gallery. Bathhouses have many features that help to create a space for retreat and relaxation. The public bath is more than just a place to wash the body. It has long served as a social forum for the local community. This time on Japanology Plus, we explore the wonderful world of bathhouses, including proper bathing etiquette and the various ways in which you can unwind and enjoy the experience. Hello, I'm Peter Barakan. Welcome to a new program called Japanology Plus. We've been doing Begin Japanology for some six and a half years now, and we thought it was just about time that we started digging a little deeper. Our theme for this first program is Sento, or public bathhouses. There's a cliche that when Japanese people are soaking in a hot bath, they use the expression gokuraku gokuraku. The word gokuraku meaning paradise in Buddhist terminology. Of course, there are all sorts of situations that could inspire divine thoughts, but for some reason, this expression is only ever used in the bath. It may be indicative of how much pleasure Japanese people get from soaking in a nice hot bath. Let's start off with a closer look at public bathhouses. A sento is a large public bathing facility with a set entry fee. There are currently around 3,800 of them in Japan. In the bathing hall, you wash in the company of other bathers, then get into a shared tub of hot water for a soothing soak. Even people who have a private bathtub at home will come to Asento to enjoy the spacious setting and a chance to chat. A system of paying to bathe dates back around 800 years in Japan. It began at a Buddhist temple when a bath used by monks to purify their bodies was made available to the public. In the 18th century, public bathhouses became a common feature of urban life. Every local community had one or two sento. In densely built up Edo, as Tokyo was then called, bathing at home was banned for fear of fire. The bathhouse was familiar to all, men and women, samurai and merchants. Japan had a class system dividing samurai, farmers, artisans and merchants. At the Sento though, artificial divisions were stripped away as the bathers shed their clothes. More than simply a way to get clean, the Sento was also a place to spend time with friends and neighbours after bathing. Japan's bathhouses continue to fill the role of community forum. It's a significant part of their timeless appeal. Hello. Machida-san, I know that you're an expert about these sento bathhouses and I'm looking forward to learning something from you today. Shinobu Machida is one of Japan's leading experts on sento. Over the last 30 plus years, he's visited 3,300 sento from Hokkaido in the north to Okinawa in the south. He has taken more than 30,000 photos, including countless valuable images of historic bathhouses. The number of sento in Japan has plunged to a quarter of what it was in the best years. As Japan's biggest fan of bathhouses, Machida can't bear the thought of losing them and works hard to promote their appeal. This is Myojinyu, a bathhouse that opened in 1958. Machida loves this place because it is one of the few among Tokyo's 700 or so that retains its original features and charm. 
This bathhouse here is actually quite unusual in Tokyo these days. You don't find many of these with the traditional architecture left now, do you? That's right. The number has really shrunk and only a few rarities like this are left in Tokyo. Shall we go on in then? Uh, hold on a moment. Before that, I'd like to explain something. Would you step back a little with me? Sento are designed to make a striking impression, to create an atmosphere of anticipation that this is no ordinary place, not just another house or building. In, in this case, anyway, yes. Yeah. So the exterior is designed to impress customers, who will then think this is the place for me and step inside. The facade is built the same way as a temple or shrine. Notice the curved roof line. It's called Karapafu, very ornate. As an architectural feature, it dates back to the 16th century. In those days, only the social elite were permitted to incorporate that style in a building. And the decorative carving on the gable is called Gegyo. That underlines the status of the bathhouse. Essentially, though, it is just a bathhouse, so why did they go to all the trouble of creating these elaborate facades? A devastating earthquake hit Tokyo in 1923. In the aftermath, carpenters trained to make temples and shrines built bathhouses like this to boost morale, so this style is found mainly in Tokyo. Really? In other parts of Japan, there isn't one specific style. In fact, outside Tokyo, Western-style buildings are more common, especially in the Kansai area, and also in the big port cities exposed early on to Western cultural influences. Mm. And is there any particular meaning in this style of architecture for a bathhouse? Yes. This curved roof line contains a symbolic message. It's a sign telling you that you're entering paradise. It's a threshold between this world and heaven. An everyday example where you see this clearly is a Japanese hearse. It's the same idea. Oh, they do use the same yeah. design on those. Exactly, that curved roof line is used to denote the world beyond. Oh, I never knew that. The one way that, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of design you have outside, the one way that you can always tell that there's a bathhouse is it has a, a long chimney. In the old days, there weren't many tall buildings. The chimney would have been a landmark. When you were explaining to someone how to get to your house, you would say, turn left at the bathhouse chimney or something like that. Myojinyu, the bathhouse that preserves its classic style intact, covers 160 square meters and can accommodate more than 60 bathers. It's quite big for a Tokyo sento. The water comes from a well and is heated by burning firewood. That's been the arrangement ever since the bathhouse first opened. Well water is gentler on the skin than tap water, and women in particular appreciate that. Many customers come here every day, even though now they can easily bathe at home. Come in. Hello. Oh, hello. This is called a bandai. It's where you pay the entry fee. The men are this side, and beyond this door, usually it's not open. That's right, normally it would be closed. Through there is the women's side, and the booth is right between the two sides. This is like the cockpit, the control center. From here, the attendant can keep an eye on the bathers. I've always wanted to see what, what it looks like from this little perch here. I wonder if uh, I could be allowed to go up there for a moment. I got us a detail this guy. Wow, it's quite steep. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, I'll be careful. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, I see you. You sit here cross-legged. <laughs> oh, and there's a little blanket as well to keep your knees warm. Ooh, <laughs> this is fun. You, it's right, you're right. It is like a little cockpit. You can see it's the men this side and the women this side. One feature of a Tokyo bathhouse is that the bandai is set high, higher than anywhere else in Japan. Why is that? 
It's raised about 130 centimeters because in Tokyo, you can get a lot of unknown faces. Occasionally, you'd get someone putting on someone else's more expensive clothes and walking out. So the attendant kept an eye on who was wearing what. In the old days, there were no lockers, just baskets. Clothes were left out in the open. Bathhouses in small towns always got the same customers. But lots of visitors came to Tokyo, so more scrutiny was needed. So you get people that you don't know, people who are coming for the first time. There may be somebody suspicious among them. Exactly. And Tokyo bathhouses are bigger too. You need to know if anyone has slipped over and hurt themselves all the way at the back. A high vantage point is also useful for checking on the safety of the bathers. The high ceiling really gives it a lovely roomy sort of feel, which is quite unusual in Japan. They tend to have a, a kind of distaste for wasting space, I think, in this country. Actually, the high ceiling is another Tokyo-only feature. Really? Elsewhere, people would be living up there. They live on top of Hi. the bathhouse. Hi. Oh, I see. See the coffered ceiling? This style is called gotenjo. And you can also see the S-shaped parts around the edges. That feature is called oriage. Combining these two features, the ceiling is doubly elaborate. Why? It's another thing from temple and shrine architecture. The ceiling looks just like this. So it's not just the outside, they're repeating the same thing on the inside as well, so that you're aware of it all the time. Yes, because the idea is to create a space evocative of paradise, and the ceiling helps to set that tone. Another hallmark of Tokyo Sento is the garden. Ah, oh, yes. Uh -huh. It's a dry landscape garden, very traditional with no water in it. And the highlights include those rocks from Mount Fuji. It's lava from the, from the volcano. Oh. Now you can't remove lava from Mount Fuji because it's a UNESCO site, but before these rocks were very cheap and they look impressive. You can stack them any way you want. They represent Mount Fuji. Okay. Okay. This area can be thought of as a little sacred space. There are all kinds of interesting touches like this in Tokyo public bathhouses. Certain items are a fixture in every sento. Here's an example, a massage chair. I haven't seen one of these in, I don't know how many years now. I mean, the first time you see one of these, unless you're Japanese, it probably looks like a torture machine. If you actually try it, it feels great. You can get a five-minute massage for 10 or 20 yen. You also have scales too. <laughs> this again, I mean, Swiss. how far back does this go? It must be decades old. In the old days, people didn't have scales at home. They would check their weight at the bathhouse. Okay, Hi. okay. So now, finally, let's look at the space inside. Complete with its mural, of course. In Tokyo, many bathhouses have a landscape mural on the back wall of the bathing hall. Moist air and mold damage the murals, so they have to be repainted every few years. These days, Japan has only two painters specializing in bathhouse murals. One of them is Morio Nakajima, who has been in the business for 48 years. Murals must be repainted in just five hours, while the sento is closed. In fact, two murals, one each for the men and the women. There is no sketch. The new mural is painted directly over the old one. The image already exists in Nakajima's head. He uses just four colors of paint, mixing them to create other shades. He harnesses his long years of experience. Deftly handling brushes and rollers, he creates color gradations. These gradations impart a sense of depth to the painting. At first, he seems to be painting aimless strokes. 
but when he daubs on some green, a pine forest suddenly appears. About two hours after starting, he finishes the new mural. A mural for a bathhouse should present the scene as naturally as possible. It should be big and bright. It should produce a sense of distance and space. That depth is achieved by modulating the light and shadow. I want people to feel that they're really bathing out of doors and enjoying a beautiful vista. That's what I think about while I'm painting the murals. The landscape murals of public bathhouses are crafted to create a soothing sense of natural grandeur. It feels really strange being here with your clothes on. Viewers, please imagine we're naked. And of course, people will generally be sitting on one of these stools here, getting clean before getting into the bath, so at least yes. let's sit down. OK, now, Mount Fuji. Hi. There's always a picture of Mount Fuji on the wall in the bathhouse. That's actually a Tokyo invention. It's basically only seen in Sento around Tokyo. Really? So in other parts of Japan, do they have pictures of other things on the walls? Usually no pictures, just tiles and so on. OK, so we in Tokyo are lucky then. We have murals on the walls. OK. And you can see that the big tubs are set against the wall. That's another Tokyo thing. Elsewhere, the main tubs are in the middle. Really? The idea is that the tub water comes from the water in the mural. And there is always water in the Mount Fuji mural. A lake, a river, the sea. Beyond the water in the Sento is the water in the mural. It stimulates the imagination of the bathers. It helps them to picture themselves actually immersed in the landscape. By the way, how hot are the baths? I've never been quite sure. They seem to be a little different in different places. In Tokyo, the water is at least 42 degrees Celsius. Elsewhere, not quite so hot. The hot baths in Tokyo are traditional. It's a practice that dates back centuries to the Edo period. Why is that, do you know? The city bathhouses had loads of customers. They didn't want people to linger in the big tub, so they raised the water temperature. Ah, oh, so from a business point of view, it's better as well. And that tradition remains to this day. Another thing to note is that when you get into the tub, you're immersing yourself in the pure water of Mount Fuji, the sacred mountain. Bathing in that water means purifying your body, it's rooted in the Shinto tradition of ritual purification. I think that's why older folk will say, ah, gokuraku, gokuraku, when they get in the bath. I think they're still in touch with the old ideas. OK, and that's become a tradition now, so it's something that you do, you probably don't even think about, it just comes out automatically? Young people, not so much. But older people, yes. It's a connection between the mural and the bath. These public baths are a long tradition in Japan, and people in neighborhoods would, I mean, perhaps not quite so much now, but in the old days, just about everybody would come almost every day, I guess. There must have been a real sense of community around these places. For centuries, public baths were a very important place for people to socialize and for children to learn social expectations. If they were naughty, they would be scolded by the older folks. It was a place to learn proper behavior and a place for people to talk and interact. It was like a microcosm of Japanese society. So children could learn a lot about society just by interacting with people at the bathhouse. And now we have the men's bath this side and the women's bath on the other side. Back in the Edo period, I believe they were together, weren't they? Before the late 19th century, mixed bathing was the norm. It was actually a good place to find a marriage partner. In a way, it served as a dating service for men and women. A sento was the ideal place to meet your future spouse. You have a pretty good idea if this was the person you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. But then came the influence of Christianity. 
When Westerners saw mixed bathing, they said that the Japanese were barbaric. And so, in the late 19th century, the government issued a prohibition against mixed bathing. Really? But for 20 years or so, nothing much changed because the tradition was so deeply entrenched. Matt Holt, an American translator whose Japan interests range from history to pop culture. In Plus One, he presents practical information you can use on your own Japan journey. I'm Matt Alt, and in this little corner of every episode, I'm going to explain tips and techniques for the Japan novice. In today's episode, we're going to look at Sento, Japanese baths. Now, they might seem a little complicated to the uninitiated, but once you learn the ropes, you'll see it's mainly just common sense. We're here in one of Tokyo's most famous fashion districts, the Ginza. And as you can see, there's even a Sento here. Let's go check it out. Now, the first thing to come off are your shoes. They go into these traditional shoe boxes, which are locked with an old-fashioned wooden key. Don't lose this if you ever want to see your shoes again. Next, every sento is split into female and male sides. This kind of goes without saying, but make sure you pick the right one for you if you don't want to get in trouble. You might even want to memorize the kanji just to be on the safe side. Once you've done that, it's time to go in. Now, right inside the door, you'll find the bath attendant seat, or bandai. This is where you pay your entrance fee. Now, the entrance fee differs from place to place, but here in Tokyo, it's generally 450 yen. Next, you take your clothes and you store them in this locker. Almost ready to get in the tub, but before you do, you have to remember there's a certain etiquette you have to follow here. Rule number one, no bathing suits, just your birthday suit. Rule number two, you can't just jump in the bathtub. First, you have to wash off with soap and water. And rule number three, when you use the shower, make sure to use it carefully so you don't spray water on people sitting around next to you. And always make sure to turn it off when you're done using it. Ah. Ah. Now here's an important rule. Never bring your towel into the bathtub with you. Instead, put it right up there on your head. The reasons for this are twofold. The first is pure hygiene. Nobody wants to be sitting in a bathtub full of a towel that you've been using to wipe your body with. But the other one is because condensation often forms on the ceilings of Sento, and the towel on your head helps protect you from drips. You all know what comes next, right? Ah. When you can say that at a Japanese Sento, everybody's gonna think you're a Sento expert, like me. And now we finish things off with another Japanese bath tradition, coffee-flavored milk. There's even a proper stance to take when you're drinking it. Mm, that sure hit the spot. But don't take my word for it. Try it yourself next time you hit the Japanese baths. I don't think anybody would guess that we're in yet another bathhouse now. Not while we're sitting here, at least. This doesn't look like a sento. Japan's public baths are evolving in a new direction these days. And this is typical of that trend. I mean, this place is really quite big. So what's the setup of this place? The water here comes from a natural hot spring. There are open air baths as well. There's a sauna, also a relaxation room, a massage room, games and slot machines. You can even have a meal with entertainment that might include hula, belly dancing or jazz. 
It's packed with a whole range of fun things to do. And this type of bathhouse is on the rise. What's responsible for that sort of thing happening in what is basically, I mean, people come here to have a bath. Actually, in the 19th century and earlier, this would have been a typical setup for a public bath. The whole floor above the baths used to be the area where customers would have snacks and sweets, play go or shogi, or just chat. It was like a salon. That arrangement disappeared for a time. But now it's making a comeback. Oh, really? Well, so are these kind of establishments on the increase now? There are a growing number like this, yes. But the traditional ones are declining fast. To what point? Nationwide, it's down to a quarter of the number in the old days. Right now, there are about 4,000 public bathhouses in Japan. In the peak year of 1968, there were 18,000, so less than a quarter, actually. Well, it's been really interesting talking to you today. I mean, I obviously have been in baths before, but I didn't really know anything about the history of them. And it really, it adds to your appreciation of it. I must say that when I first came to Tokyo 40 years ago, it was the first time I'd ever had a Japanese <laughs> bath. Until then, I'd always had, you know, Western-style baths where you clean yourself inside the bath. And from the first time I got in a Jap Japanese bath, I said, this is it. I'm never, ever going back. And in 40 Hi. years, I've never had a Western-style mm. bath mm. again. Mm. And the bath Hi. and the, the pleasure I get from the bath is one of the several okay. things Hi. that keeps me mm. in Japan. Although I, I have at times toyed Hi. with the idea of leaving, but I don't think I could. I have a similar story. I first took an interest in bathhouses 34 years ago when an Australian friend of mine came to visit, and I took him to one. The first thing he said was, why does the building look like a temple? That question prompted me to start researching Sento. So you, you didn't know at the time? Before that, being Japanese, I'd never even thought about it. But here was someone from a different background who took one look and came up with a tough question to answer. That really made me think. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. It's been a lot of fun. You're welcome. Next time, ramen, the noodle dish Japan can't get enough of. We'll explore the many facets of this popular food and see why eating it can be such a fun experience.